Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your <laughs> Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Sommelier of Cinema, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Chancellor of Cheerfulness, your Archduke of Banterbury, and your Existential Mr. Rogers, and whatever other names people care to hang on me, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I am here with Observations, the show about something, Observations, episode number three. 181. I'm, of course, Robcasting to you, you imagination connoisseurs, you members of this, the post geek singularity community. I want to mem uh, I, I want to welcome you all here today. If I can speak, it's Friday. Uh, all the days kind of blend into one or another. I, I don't even, um, I don't even know what they are. You know, they just keep going. I got all kinds of stuff going on. I'm uploading special features to the Shout Factory online portal where they you deliver finished videos. Uh, that's happening as we speak. I got all kinds of things happening, so that's kind of fun that I'm still delivering documentary materials that you'll be able to see later on this year. I don't know if the June 16th uh, release date will hold, but on June 16th, you will be able to buy the horror film I produced, The Hills Run Red, with oodles of special features by both director Dave Parker and myself. Uh, it has been fun delving into the uh, footage we shot 12 years ago when we made the movie. It's, it's kind of crazy. I'm glad I kept all this stuff. It all comes in handy. So you'll be able to see it. I just um, started uploading an interview with William Sadler, the great Bill Sadler, who you know from movies like Trespass and Shawshank Redemption. Of course, he played uh, Death in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, and he's playing Death again, apparently, in Bill and Ted Face the Music. And we'll let's hope we see him again. But it's a pretty cool piece. It's almost uh, 20 minutes long. A pretty cool interview with him. So all of that is happening here. There's all kinds of things happening here. Uh, life continues. And it's great. And that's why it's great to be here with you guys to keep up sort of a semblance of normality in the face of all kinds of craziness. And, of course, tonight we will have another episode. I'm actually really excited about my show I'm doing with uh, the wonderful Elizabeth whining about movies i believe it's episode nine and we're doing it on bob fossey's 1972 masterpiece cabaret bob fossey is one of my uh favorite directors and uh cabaret and all that jazz both influence my desire to film edit to want to be an editor both films are are quite amazing, and if you haven't seen Cabaret, it won a lot more Oscars at the 1972 Oscar ceremony than The Godfather did, including Best Director, Best Cinematography, and Best Editing. So tune in tonight, where Elizabeth and I are going to share a bottle of wine and talk about Cabaret, because life is a cabaret, my friends. Uh, since I was on the John Campia show... We have breaking news, more more movies delayed, uh, pushed, rescheduled, lots of craziness happening. But the first thing that I wanted to address, the first uh, thing that I wanted to talk about is the travails of poor AMC. And AMC, this is from Hollywood Reporter, this was from yesterday actually, AMC Entertainment gets ratings downgraded on COVID-19 impact. This was from yesterday. Uh, Itan Weising, S&P Global expects the mega exhibitor could have a liquidity shortfall within six months without reducing its borrowings or getting a waiver from its lenders. Now here, ladies and gentlemen, is where we really need to see AMC is not the only person. It's just something that we imagination connoisseurs are paying attention to. Obviously, there's many, many, many businesses that find themselves in this same position, and I'm hoping that this is where bailouts well not they're not really I wouldn't call them bailouts because I, I I would say life preservers maybe anybody who's willing to kick in and help these businesses debt rate a uh, dep dep debt debt ratings agency s p global ratings on Thursday reduced AMC entertainment's credit rating on liquidity concerns should the closer of the mega exhibitors theaters amid the uh, COVID-19 crisis continued deep into the summer. The ratings agency said it expected AMC's theaters to remain closed beyond June. 
We do not believe AMC has sufficient sources of liquidity to cover its expected negative cash flows past mid-summer, and we believe the company will likely breach its six times net senior secured leverage covenant, uh, which when tested on September 30th, 2020, absent a waiver from its lenders. S&P Global said in a ratings note, the agency downgraded AMC's ratings to triple C from B with a negative outlook. S&P Global ratings on March 16th first said it would review AMC's ratings amid the coronavirus pandemic for potential downgrade. That was after the exhibition giant unveiled a 50-50 policy through April 30th to limit attendance at movie screenings amid the coronavirus, but the U.S. market's largest cinema chain closed all 600 of its stateside locations on March 17th as the coronavirus outbreak dramatically spread. Then on Tuesday, CEO Adam Aaron told CNBC he believed the shuttered U.S. movie theaters may reopen by mid-June. S&P Global reduced AMC's credit rating even as it expected the exhibitor to attempt a debt restructuring. The company will likely pursue incremental financing through the CARES Act or its lenders, but it is unclear when or if it will be able to secure additional liquidity. The ratings agency said, alternatively, AMC could use possible funds it secures through its U.S. government stimulus package in response to the coronavirus outbreak. AMC closing all of its movie screens was followed by around uh, 26,000 employees being furloughed or let go. That included all of its 600 corporate employees and CEO Aaron. Now, why I thought this was something that was worth pointing out, obviously, AMC, I've, I've grown fond of AMC. Uh, with their Dolby Cinemas, I think they're doing a, a pretty good job in terms of movie exhibition. Every time I've gone to an AMC lately, I have always uh, seen incredible presentation, both picture and sound-wise. They've been upgrading their theaters. They're definitely a company that we as Imagination Connoisseurs, I think, should support. And by no fault of their own, as with many, 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 many other co uh, companies around the world, they're finding themselves in a position where, I mean, their business was stopped it's not like it was because of mismanagement like other businesses uh like other businesses have found themselves not through any kind of mismanagement but because their business just shuttered in order to protect the the, the population and kudos to them and i'm hoping that amc obviously will be able to be helped through this and we're all in the same boat i mean all of us and i think that I don't know if we've ever seen anything like this on a global scale in all of human history, to be honest, when we're so uh, interconnected. It's it's important that we be mindful. I'm just using AMC because I like AMC. I like movies, obviously. It's just one of countless other businesses that are many uh, completely unrelated to the entertainment business. But I think that, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I am not an economist. I, I certainly... <laughs> Could have done more in my life to make lots more money, um, you know, uh, which I haven't done. But uh, I definitely appreciate what they have been doing business-wise for so long. And I just, I'm just i using them as an example of the sacrifices that have been made. I just hope that when it comes to figuring out a way... I mean, after all, money only works because we all decide to say it does. It's a collective decision. That's where the economies of the world come from. And it'll be interesting to see if we all um, are going to figure out a way out of all of this. Now, you know, you can't necessarily forgive debt because the world, the world, it's not the way the economy works. And I completely understand that. Um, but maybe it's a blip. You know, maybe if we can just everybody forgives any debt, we got to put people back to work and all that. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, we're not out of this yet, but we shall see. Since I got off the John Campia show and on to this show, huge release news has happened. The entire Marvel Cinematic Universe has now changed. And uh, I wanted to talk about that and share that with you. This from Deadline at 11.30 a.m. This dropped 100 minutes ago. Uh, off Marvel, well, here it goes. Black Widow takes Eternals fall date, which bums me out because Eternals was one of my most eagerly awaited movies of the summer. Now, let me, again, just say that we cover, as Imagination Connoisseurs, entertainment news. We like our science fiction, fantasy, and horror. This is not to say that this is the most important news to be covering, but I just, I, 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 I'm just doing what I do. And I, I'm presenting you the information as it drops here. 
and I thought it would be of interest to you, and hopefully I can take your mind away from everything else going on in the world. But when I do these shows, I want everyone to understand that I am, in fact, covering what we like. That does not mean that there's way more important things going on all around us. I'm just reporting what happens and in our little community, and I'm I'm very mindful of that. So I just want you to know, people might say, well, Rob, why are you even talking about this kind of thing? What does it matter? It really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. What matters is that people stay healthy. That's what really matters, uh, and that we don't see our entire world economy crater. People's livelihoods are obviously more important. That said, that said, and not to be glib or flippant, uh, I'm just reporting on imagination connoisseurs, who want to know when their movies are coming out. Marvel has changed things around a lot. And uh, I just thought I'd jump into this for you. The Mother Studio franchise picks Disney has made some release date changes today, which further underscores studios planning that the summer box office season starts later than sooner. With Artemis Fowl, originally on Memorial Day weekend, heading to Disney Plus, wow, which is a big deal, and Universal's Candyman remake or reboot, I guess it's in the same universe, now on September 25th, Disney Pixar's soul is left standing at the f- expected first pick of the summer. First off, despite the nonsensical fanboy rumors last weekend that Black Widow and Mulan were headed to Disney+, Plus, which would never happen, that is indeed not the case, and they are staying put in theaters. Mulan, which is already a locked print, having had its world premiere in Hollywood earlier this month, will open on July 24th, sending Dwayne Johnson and Emily Blunt's Jungle Book, which was on that date, to to July 30th, 2021, uh, once again, along with Justice for Han, or as other people would call it, the Fast Saga. Uh, uh, The Jungle Book is being pushed a year into July uh, July 30th, 2021. Given the halting of feature production in the world out of safety from COVID-19, 2021 is going to need movies. Just like we forecasted after MGM's No Time to Die moved to November, Black Widow is taking over Eternal's November 6th slot, which is setting off an even Marvel chain reaction, whereas Eternal's moves off of its November slot to February 12th, 2021, pushing Shang-Chi to May 7th, which was Doctor Strange 2's date. Doctor Strange 2 now moves to November 5th, 2021, which was Thor Love and Thunder's old date. Thor Love and Thunder moves to February 18th, 2022, which was a spot for an untitled Marvel pick, which is not going to be there anymore. Black Panther 2 remains on May 8th, 2022, and Captain Marvel 2 is now set for July 8th, 2022, which Disney already RSVP'd for an untitled live-action pick. That release date change ease with the Marvel movies comes from Disney having control over key juggernaut dates on the calendar. And as far as this morning's other big shocker, Kenneth Branagh's Artemis Fowl heading to Disney+. Plus which is crazy because it was going to be a big movie. Much like Universal's in-home event experiment with Trolls World Tour, it appears a similar plan is in effect for this feature adaptation of the Yoing Colfer book. Yoing? Is that how you pronounce Yoing? I don't know. Uh, With Disney largely in the event franchise brand business, Artemis Fowl, like Wrinkle in Time before it, may have seemed a risky play at theaters, especially in future unpredictable environment. In a future unpredictable environment. Other big changes from the Burbank studio. 20th Century Fox studio Ryan Reynolds' comedy Free Guy goes from July 3rd to December 11th. Another huge move. Current December releases from Disney 20th include Steven Spielberg's West Side Story and Ridley Scott's The Last Duel. Both picks' respective dates remained unchanged on December 18th and December 25th, which is limited. Wes Anderson's The French, they said Fresh Dispatch. The French Dispatch from Searchlight goes from July 24th to October 16th. Lucasfilm, uh, their Indiana Jones 5, which is still locking down a deal with new director James Mangold moves off its date of July 9th, 2021 to July 29th, 2022. So Indiana Jones 5 moves an entire year. Searchlights, the personal history of David Copperfield and Antlers and 20th's Women in the Woman in the Window and the New Mutants remain undated at this time 
with release dates to be announced soon. Here is the current summer release schedule as it stands now. On June 19th, Pixar's Soul, Lionsgate's Fatal opens, and the King of Staten Island from Universal is still slated for July 19th. July 3rd is Free Guy, which we know now is gone. Uh, July 10th, the untitled Purge movies is, uh, who knows, Bob's Burgers on July 17th, and Tenet from Warner Brothers are still going strong. Mulan is at July 24th. Come Play from Focus Features is there. SpongeBob on the Run, July 31st. Barb and Star go to the Vista Del Mar, or go to Vista Del Mar is still there. Empty Man is there on August 7th, and Infinite with Paramount. Wonder Woman 1984 is still dated now for August 14th. The one and only Ivan from Disney and Nobody from Universal are still on August 14th. And August 21st, Bill and Ted Face the Music, the untitled Fred Hampton Project, and Let Him Go from Focus Features is there. And the Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard is now, they say the Hitman's Bodyguard Part 2, but I think it's the Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, and Spell are on August 28th. And then, of course, A Quiet Place 2 is September 4th. So there are a lot of changes, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of changes happening but these were necessary, so kudos to. I mean, we're in we're in such uncharted territory these days. It's it's pretty nuts. I mean, it's really really a crazy time. But on the other hand, it was a necessary time, and I think everybody's just acting accordingly. I I just want to see people like AMC be able to come roaring back. Again, we have no we don't know what's going on with Comic Con yet. Obviously, WonderCon was. Uh, pushed but who knows what is going to happen uh it's nutty it's nutty listen i was gonna play some videos today uh from fans i'm gonna move those to tomorrow i found some people sent me videos a long time ago that i didn't realize were there so i've got a few more if if you guys sent me videos and think i'm a monumental douchebag for not playing them you're gonna start seeing them i've dipped back in and i'm looking at things and i'm uh, people sent me some cool cool videos. One one of our fans had a home theater, a member of the Post Geek Singularity sent me a home theater video, which is very cool. So I'm going to start playing those. I got that Funko Pop video you guys are going to love. So it's all it's all happening, as they said in Almost Famous. So we're, 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 we're going on. It's, it's the show must go on. Um, you know, I, I'm going to jump right into uh, your chats and we'll go and see what people have to say. Um, Calvin Bose sent in a few tips. I've got a, f a bunch of Calvin videos as well. Uh, Calvin says, how come when Star Trek was on VHS, the episodes were by episode order, but on DVD and Blu-ray by air date, they should have just kept them by episode number. Uh, well, yeah, um, I think you might be right about that, but air date was actually, you know, when they first came out on VHS, I have to tell you when Star Trek was sort of unique. It was an anomaly. Back on VHS, there was not a lot of TV shows that had come out a full series on videotape. That was a that was pretty unique to Star Trek. I mean, there were sure there were other shows like Twilight Zone did, but they were released. It was special, and people didn't pay much uh, pay much attention to things like seasons and air dates and things like that. But in the DVD world, te television became huge huge seller on DVD and you know I don't think most people paid any attention to which season was out and uh, the DVD world changed all that which moved into of course Blu-ray and that's why that happened Calvin so things were things were different back then they were definitely different but now it's all about uh, season by air date and so things changed and that as everyone knows on September 8th in North America well not actually in America the first um, episode of Star Trek ever broadcast was The Man Trap, and that was broadcast on September 8th, 1966. Uh, but that was not the first, well, the second pilot, which is the first pilot for Star Trek where William Shatner played Captain Kirk, which was Where No Man Has Gone Before, which was actually the third episode aired. So, yeah, air date and production order, very, very different things. Very different things. Calvin goes on to say, and he says, I was thinking about you refusing to see Sound of Music 
<laughs> and it reminded me of what my PE teacher would tell us. You're going to learn something even if all you learn is you hate baseball and will never play it again. You were still better for it. Well, as everyone knows, I had a huge blind spot in my cinematic education. Uh, that was Sound of Music. And I was able, 1965's Robert Wise, actually Robert Wise also produced Sound of Music in addition to directing it. And I finally watched it, and the last episode of Eliza Views, whining about the movies, was indeed about Sound of Music. And tonight, we're going to talk about another musical. Bob Fosse sort of reimagined the Hollywood musical. He reimagined the stage show of Cabaret and gave us Cabaret, 1972's Cabaret, that brought uh, Academy Awards for Liza Minnelli for Best Actress, Joel Grey, I think probably for Best Supporting, but he did win. And, of course, it won for cinematography. Jeffrey Unsworth, who went on to shoot things like Superman the movie. Uh, amazing, amazing stuff. And we'll talk about that tonight. So that's very exciting. And, yes, I am much better for watching Sound of Music. And I found it to be really delightful. I really did. It's it's now one of my favorite things, Sound of Music. So there you go. Um Calvin Bowes goes on and says, when studios make films, they don't make them for fans, but try and make them for the average moviegoer. Thus, Disney made movies to, or just made films that look like Star Wars. Well, here's the thing. I don't think that that's true. Do you know who people... When, when you're making a movie, you're not thinking about who you're making the movie for. Diehard fans or movie-going audiences. You're making movie for the audience. The audience. Uh, you're trying to tell a story that appeals to everybody who's interested in movie going. So you're trying to make the best movie you possibly can. The fact that there are fans of franchises, that's that's a bonus. But when anybody, I guarantee you, when anybody you, you meet, any filmmaker worth their salt is not necessarily thinking about a targeted audience. They're trying to make movies for the audience. There is only one movie going audience, and that is the audience movie going audience so what you're trying to do is make the best movie possible that you hope has the widest possible appeal but obviously the movies get made i think there's two reasons movie get movies get made the first reason is that the studios think yes they're going to make money at the end of the day movies are a product to be sold to be hopefully consumed by the largest amount of people possible which means that the people are make who are making movies are, are believe when they start in before they've even made their movie. They're making a product that is going to be enjoyed by the most amount of people. And by doing that, the way to do that is to make the best movie possible. And it doesn't matter what genre you're working in, but you're trying to make a film that appeals to everyone. Look, when Walt Disney was making live-action movies, when like Treasure Island, like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, like In Search of the Castaways or whatever you want, whatever live action movies were, were Disney was making while he was still alive. Um, Mary Poppins. He's trying to make movies that are the best movies possible. He knows that he is appealing to a family audience. So yes, indeed, they were making films for everyone, for multi-generations of people. Now, if you're making The French Connection, William Friedkin making The French Connection of The Exorcist, Bill Friedkin knows Hurricane Billy, as if I'm on a first-name basis with him. We've somehow, I've met him a few times, we've exchanged tweets, but I don't know William Friedkin. I, I don't think I can call him Billy Friedkin. I haven't earned the right. But when William Friedkin made French Connection and The Exorcist, he knows he's not making films for the family audience, but he is making films for the entire movie-going audience. Uh, kids shouldn't be seeing The Exorcist or French Connection when they're young because they're they're for adults. But he's still trying to make movies for all adults. There's not a lot of people, I think, that uh, wouldn't want to go see something like The Exorcist or The French Connection. But William Friedkin is not sitting there going, I'm only making The uh, French Connection for people that are predisposed to liking cop movies. Predisposed to, you know, people that pick their feet in Poughkeepsie. That's not what William Friedkin was trying to do. He's trying to make the best cop thriller possible same was true of the exorcist he wanted to scare the bejesus out of everybody make a movie that was deeply unsettling but still had really interesting things about faith and our society and the loss of that faith what does that all mean so yeah absolutely so filmmakers are trying to appeal to everybody not just fans Johnny Long sends in a tip and says well I haven't watched Picard yet but I listen to almost every Rob Observations episode thank you for that 
At least try to. Anyways, I'm starting to feel your pain with Season 7 of The Clone Wars. It's painful to watch the last three episodes since we finally got to see Ahsoka Tano. I mean, I get what they're going for with the common theme in Star Wars teaching us right from wrong. And if you've been keeping up with the show, you know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. But these have just been filler episodes. I have not watched The Clone Wars yet. I haven't caught up with it. It's, it's on my radar. Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to catch up with everything I need to see. Uh, I haven't seen that yet. I really like The Clone Wars a lot. I can't wait to see. I really like Season 6, so this new season, I'm very excited to see. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't I don't know. I, I can't speak to that. Uh, Willow sends in a tip and says, Sorry if someone might have asked already, but have you watched Tiger King? I have not. I can't wait to watch Tiger King. Uh, what are your thoughts about it? I haven't watched it, but, man, I love me those Netflix true crime documentaries. Uh, I really, really want to see it. Obviously, it's the... It's sweeping the nation. So, absolutely, do I want to watch Tiger King? Yes, ma'am. Richard sends in a tip and says, What I find erotic... Erotic. What I find ironic. Well, Richard, what you find... I What you find ironic, I might find erotic. We'll see. Uh, Richard sends in a tip and says, Is there nothing... Uh, is I, What I find ironic about Star Trek Picard and its deconstructionism is that I think the biggest deconstruction about Star Trek I ever saw was in the episode Homefront, when it looked like a Starfleet coup against the Federation might take place. Is there nothing more deconstructing than Starfleet officers who solve impossible problems on a weekly basis and are fantastic at everything, finding their frequently impotent civilian oversight wanting? I agree with you. You know, and one of the things, uh, Homefront, that was part of a two-part Deep Space Nine episode where you find out that the changelings, they're, they're on Earth. And during the Dominion War, these changelings are on Earth. But, you know, while we're watching Starfleet officers and you're looking at sort of a, like John Frankenheimer's Seven Days in May, you're looking at a, a coup happening. And then you find out what which is even more chilling. They, I think there was only four changelings on Earth that were able to sow such uh, craziness. But cooler heads prevailed. And and that was the whole thing. Was it Homefront and Paradise Lost, I'm not sure, but the um, uh, uh, cooler heads prevailed, ultimately, and the thing about Deep Space Nine, everyone's always saying, well, Deep Space Nine is is this deconstruction of the Roddenberry Star Trek ethos about the uh, positive view of the future, and I've often said, no, it, 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 it is not a deconstruction of that, because still, our characters in the face of a galactic conflict, literally a galactic conflict, are able to even though they, there are questionable things that happen in the fog of war, as they do, they were able to maintain their status as Starfleet officers and, and continue on. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. And I think ultimately there's nothing wrong with showing a situation. Again, it's the way things are presented. I even have no problem with if there's extreme violence that you're going to show, but the character in Picard, you you literally had murder committed every episode, and you had, you know, a Romulan senator was beheaded for daring to threaten Picard, and you know here was a man who presumably had a family who was a senator, an esteemed politician at one point that we watched him lose his life because because Picard wanted to go into a bar where he clearly wasn't welcome and make a point. I mean, I found that to be honestly highly offensive. But anyway, but you're absolutely right, Richard. Absolutely right, I think. Um, but I, you know, I want to sort of, we're, as we move away, as, as Picard goes further and further into the rearview mirror, I'm sure we'll all talk about it. People are, are tired of listening to me talk about it. But, uh, and I'll continue on, but yes. Uh, Jamie Cruz asks, have you missed the Tango Shalom movie trailer? You have not. Um, we we really can't release, I mean, we to be honest, we, we never even sent, Tango Shalom out. We were about to start sending it to streaming services and people to look at for distribution, but we put the kibosh on that when this all started to happen. Uh, there is a trailer, and there's a version of the trailer. I, I'm not totally satisfied with it, but I kind of curtailed. I stopped working on it as I moved over to deliver all the special features to Shout Factory for the Hills Run Red Blu-ray, but you did not miss it. I will definitely tell you about it. Um, I will say this. Karina Smirnoff, our lead actress, uh, just had a child, Karina Smirnoff from Dancing with the Stars, which is very, very exciting. And uh, congratulations to her. 
and I'm hoping that I'll have more news about Tango Shalom shortly, but really not much is happening, uh, which is frustrating. Claudius sends in a tip and says, Bonjour, Rob. You don't have to apologize for talking about geekdom. Right now, you're performing a public service. The post-geek singularity is a welcome and necessary respite from the science reality nightmare we're all living. Yes, uh, it's true. Uh, I, I, It is kind of a nightmare. And I have to tell you, I mean, I'm out of booze and we don't even have any wine for tonight. So we're going to have to venture out into the world to get supplies, um, which kind of is a bummer. But it needs to be done. You know, and, and uh, there's things like like uh, Tribeca and uh, the Southwest Film, Southwest, South by Southwest Film Festival. They're going to be streaming, I think, some of their movies. And I feel terrible about, I have friends that got into both South by Southwest and they got into Tribeca. And, you know, it's a dream to get into a festival like Tribeca or South by South, Southwest for a filmmaker. And you, you get to be elated for a while going, oh, my God, you know, Ben David Grabinski's movie was going to play at Tribeca. And, and then they shutter these festivals. I don't know how they're going to be able to play movies and not. How do you stop them from being pirated? Unfortunately, I don't I don't know if putting them online is a big thing. I don't know how they're going to prevent that. I mean, it is a big thing. I don't know how they're going to prevent piracy from happening, but we'll wait and see. Stubble McShave sends in a super chat and says, we're having a drinking game. Talk responsibly. What do I have to say uh, to talk responsibly? <laughs> uh, what do I have to say to get you all to drink? I don't have any alcohol. I got water, though. I got ice water in my Allagash, my Allagash Brewing Company glass that was sent to me uh, by a fan. So, Tom, thanks for that. You know... I, sometimes I forget, but having ice cold water, and before someone says, you know, Rob, ice cold water isn't good for you, having ice cold water where you can feel, uh, feel a big ice, piece of ice on your upper lip, I just, I love that. I love the way it feels going down. Uh, Mark Evans sends in a tip and says, "Watched I watched Critical Drinker's review yesterday of Alien Covenant, and I had genuinely totally forgotten about. Wow, talk about forgettable. You know, Alien Covenant is a hot mess, but I have to tell you, it's one of the most beautifully made science fiction films ever. Woo, that movie is gorgeous. I like the score, but man, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Garen G <laughs> Gillum says, Rob, I heard you call my native San Pedro part of the underbelly of L.A. on the John Campy show today. So many movies and shows have been and still are filmed in San Pedro, but there's supposed to be other places. Pedro was Pedro in To Live and Die in L.A. Great film. Uh, yes, my, my film pick for today on the John Campy show was my beloved, beloved To Live and Die in L.A. I love William Friedkin's 1985 police thriller, To Live and Die in L.A. It's actually not a police thriller. I might have called it a police thriller. It's not. It's about a Secret Service agent. It's about law enforcement, but it is about the Secret Service, and I need. I hope I said that correctly on the show. I, I hope I didn't call it a police procedural um, because that does. that's not fair. That's not fair to our police or good policing. And uh, it's about a Secret Service agent. So if I did say that on the John Campy show, I, I apologize. Uh, I love police thrillers. I love detective stories. I love Secret Service stories. And if you want to see uh, a, a great, great movie starring William, P William Peterson from CSI and, of course, Michael Mann's Manhunter. And, of course, the great Willem Dafoe is the counterfeiter Rick Masters. And a score by Wang Chung. I'm not kidding. They did the score, and it's great. There's also songs off their albums, Points on the Curve, uh, like such as Wait and Dance Hall Days. Oh, what a great movie. And it's about a Secret Service agent whose partner is killed, and he is obsessively going after the man responsible, counterfeiter Rick Masters, and he's going to stop at nothing. And the film is peak 1980s. It came out in October of 85. It's so good. If you have never seen To Live and Die in L.A., Wow. You know, talk about breaking the rules. Uh, it's it's really great. Uh, Mark C. sends in a super chat and says, if Rob says verisimilitude, take three drinks. Well, if that's the drinking game, you know, I I do call myself the Viceroy of Verisimilitude. I didn't, but somebody else did, and the name sticks. I really like the idea of verisimilitude. I think the first time I ever heard the word verisimilitude is when Richard Donner was talking about verisimilitude in regards to Superman the movie. 
And the idea of the reality, the verisimilitude of Superman existing in our world, I think is very, very important. And, uh, uh, you know, I've always loved verisimilitude. And I'll tell you something. Tonight we're going to talk about verisimilitude because verisimilitude plays a big part in Cabaret. The verisimilitude of, of the world is part of what Bob Fosse was going for. And I think as far as musicals go, it really does have a lot of verisimilitude. So maybe if the word verisimilitude was what I was supposed to be saying, if you are indeed playing a drinking game being home on a Friday, let's hope I helped you all drain your glasses. So once again, verisimilitude is very important to me. And if you are playing that drinking game, Mark C., well then, perhaps everybody is exactly where they want to be right now. So thank you for playing. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> uh, I do have some letters from people. Yeah, so why don't we just let's uh, let's let's read some letters from our fellow imagination connoisseurs because they are coming in over the transom. And guess who wrote us a letter? Vesna, ladies and gentlemen, Vesna Lukic. Lukic, is that how you pronounce your last name, Vesna? Did I get it right? Uh, Vesna is, of course, writing letters all the way from Sarajevo. Miss Sarajevo, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, this is a long letter. Vesna has has uh, dropped in with the goods. She came out, came out firing. So this from our own Vesna, one of our long-term... Uh, I, I dare say, uh, if Willow Yang is the princess of the post-geek singularity then Vesna's probably the queen of, of, she's definitely royalty here, and it's great to hear from her, and I'm very happy to read this letter. Hello, Robert, the master of our dungeon of fun and wonder. I love that we live in a dungeon, dungeon of fun and wonder. I know what kind of dungeon you want to be in, Vesna. You can't fool me. Uh, we'll celebrate International Women's Day together. How's that? Hello, Robert, the master of our dungeon of fun and wonder and my fellow prisoners. I know that most of the time we park our shuttles in the same shuttle bay. I like how that sounds. But this time, my shuttle goes to the other side of the moon. I like Picard. Not just a character in Sir Patrick Stewart as an actor, but also the series. I don't think that it's a perfect show or that it, it's the top TV, but there's enough good things in it for me to like it, and I want to share my thoughts and opinions with you. So what you're saying now, Vesna, is you're actually taking me down into your dungeon, and you're going to basically, you know, hit me with a whip or paddle my bare bottom or really, really soften me up, I think. Uh, okay. There's only one thing that really bothers me, and I hate every time I hear it during the show, and that's when Rafi keeps calling him JL. Not even his close friends like Riker, Deanna, or Data call him that. Cursing never bothered me because only people from Earth were using the word fuck as swearing, and it is part of our culture. Every single language has it, not just English. Others, like Romulans, use it only as a verb. <laughs> there are some characters I don't really care that much for, although I think they're very interesting and have a good story arc. Like Soji. I prefer her sister, Sutra. You know I do too, Vesna. Bow, chicka, bow, bow. Um, and Agnes, although there are some very interesting parts in that character that I like, which I will address later. Despite all the others, I like our little black-haired space legless Elnor. Of course you do, because you want to take him down to your dungeon. I know what you're up to. Maybe it's because of my maternal instinct, or maybe it's just some other type of instinct that is not so pure and platonic. That's what I'm talking about. Now let's get started with the things that I love, and I must warn you, there are a lot of them. First, the characters. I love Picard in this show, and I think that it's a natural path for him. He is still the old, same, caring, smooth-talking, diplomatic pacifist as before, except he is disappointed and broken a 94-year-old man with a fatal brain tumor, although they never explicitly call it a tumor, because I guess we would expect that it could be treatable in the future. Like any other retired man who was once very respectable and with power, he's found himself to be useless. He even said that to his Romulan friends, that he was just waiting to die. The arrival of uh, Dodge changed that, not because he liked her so much, but it gave him a purpose, a goal, and it made him live again. I've heard complaints wh where why everybody in Starfleet is dressing him without any respect, even the clerk boy. Are you going to tell me that you want... Oh, no, I won't say that. I see that as normal. He left Starfleet 14 years ago, and that clerk was in elementary school back then. 
And as any other young man who finds himself in a position of some kind of power, he doesn't care about legends and old people. As for the others, like Commander Kirsten Clancy, although he was their legendary admiral, uh, he was just one of many others and left. In her mind and the mind of others, he betrayed them, deserted them. I also found his threat of resignation reasonable. He was trying to save Romulans from extinction. He failed not by his fault. He was one man in the entire Federation. I know they should be better, but they're only human, and we, humans from Earth, never change. Maybe our means and laws change, but underneath it, we as a species are still xenophobic, jealous, and vindictive. Well, we're supposed to be different in the future. Uh, so yeah, also every government has its own agenda, even the Federation. That's why they're afraid of synths. Fear creates hatred. But I think there's another reason why Federation hates synths. Humans were always searching for perfection. They wanted to look perfect, act perfect, live forever, be young and beautiful. But as soon as somebody stands out, it brings out the worst from us. Envy and jealousy. One look at synths reminds us how imperfect we are, so we have a desire to destroy them. Picard is different. He doesn't envy and he doesn't want to be like them. Perfect. That's why he would hate it if his mind would be transferred into a young, perfect, immortal body. He didn't even want to be transferred to a golem, but because he just wanted to fulfill Data's biggest desire to be human, what is the most organic thing of all? To die of old age. And I love that touch near the end. His mind, In his mind, he looked as an old man, but for why Romulans hate synths, especially the Zat Vash, because of a legend, and a legend may be the biggest fuel for fear and hatred. But did you really believe that the Romulans would believe in that? Now back to Picard. I also love how he was struggling to pilot the La Serena. First, he didn't do it for very long, and second, it's a different ship than the Enterprise, and he is not a Mary Sue, like some others. Why he is not the true commander anymore? Because that wasn't his ship. His crew is entirely voluntarily there, and with the age, he became wiser when the big stakes are involved by letting other people fixing the things that gives them more self-confidence, but when he should, he steps out or steps in with his diplomatic ability to save the galaxy. There is nothing about that character that I don't like. Now let's talk about his crew. I love that they're all outsiders, haunted by their own demons, because if they're not, they would still be a part of Starfleet like Riker and wouldn't be able to help him. Riker doesn't own the ship, and he's still in active service in Starfleet, meaning he can't fly with Picard if he's not allowed to, which he is by the end, immediately came with help. Picard gave them all a purpose in life. Raffi, who lost her family and her home because of her job, when she lost it, she didn't have anywhere to go back to. She couldn't afford a better place to live, and frankly, I think she didn't care. Her home is the spaceship, and as soon as she is back there, she felt alive. Rios, who, who also didn't care for anybody after he lost his father figure in every single way, morally and physical, in front of his eyes. But now, as a human being, he needed some sort of company, so he created these holograms. Notice how, when he started to care for his companions, they just disappeared and have never shown up again? As I've said before, I like Space Legolas, and I understand why he's acting the way he does. During his whole life, he was surrounded by women, and although he was trained to be an assassin, he was also treated as a young boy. Women usually treat their sons like that. The only father figure he had was Picard, and he also knows that he wasn't Picard's first pick. He went there to seek help from the Coop Milot, and they offered it to him. All he has is his sword, but hey, he knows how to wield it very well. And you know, I know you love people who know how to wield their swords well, Vesna. You know I do. Unfortunately, he obviously doesn't know how to wield the other thing, which is why he never had a chance with Seven of Nine, even if he likes her a lot. A character I don't care much for is Agnes. She knows her job, but is also bored with her life. But there's one thing I do like about her, and that's what everyone else hates. She's really a born killer. All the others are trained to be like that, like Seven of Nine or Elrom. She looks all goody-goody, but she resented her lover for leaving her, so as soon as the first chance appeared to punish him, she did it, with a vision from O or without. Tears are there, just a facade. She even admitted that to Picard later, that she had found her gift. <laughs> oh my god, that's dark. As for Nerissa and Narek, their minds were poisoned by an early age with a story of rogue synths, especially Nerissa, who was the only one who survived physically undamaged, the vision of the admonition. But because of that, she became a fanatic, as, as like all of them, she believes that what she's doing is right and won't stop until she gets stopped. That's it for the characters, although I have some opinions about the others. I think this is enough for now. Now let's talk about something that is the common thing for everybody who doesn't like this series. The story. 
I actually like the story and find the reasoning for everything that happened. I think this will be interesting for the drinking game on the chat. Now pay attention. As I said previously, Picard went to find Soji because of his own purpose, so he needed the ship. First, he asked for one from Starfleet, but they didn't give it to him. Why, I explained before, they don't want to waste a ship for a synth rescue and he's not a member of Starfleet anymore. No general is going to give a plane to an ex-pilot. So he needed help from somebody else. Why Raffi? Because she's no longer a member of Starfleet either. So she has connections with people who are also out of the service. When he found out where Soji was, he needed help from some other powerful organization, which is why he left to Vashti. He also needed information about Soji and the synths, and who else can give him that than Maddox. So he left to Free Cloud. Now, the way I saw it, Free Cloud is a place like Vegas, meaning anybody who is normal is weird. Now, I agree their disguise is silly, but did you see how everyone else looked there? I also think I know why Maddox got killed. If he can't be interro interrogated by the Zot Vosh about the nest, and he couldn't, he should be killed before telling anybody else about it. After he rescued Soji, he needed a place to hide. He couldn't get back on the ship because they'll be captured, so I went to the only place he felt safe, to his family. I won't go on about why Riker is making pizza. Hey, who doesn't like homemade pizza? But I will just say why I think their son died. They simply didn't have time to save him. They couldn't do it on a ship because of the ban. Nobody wanted to risk their job for his son. Believe it or not, there are these sorts of people everywhere. So he died before they reached Nepenthe, what, as we've heard, has healing soil. I think it took too much time already, so I'll skip to the last episode in Space Orchids and the Magical Tool. First, I think that tool is not so magical after all. It was designed It was designed to detect the mechanical problem and to fix it. Rios had to phys physically touch the power station of the ship with it so it could work. How is it fixed? Maybe it just restarted the power. As for the ships, it was sort of a delusion like holograms, but those ships were useless. When one of them was hit, the Lost Arena almost crushed, and then they all disappeared right after that. So it just creates an illusion, not the real thing. I know. Um, now, where all those orchids came from, well, after Saga told them there were only 10 left, well, they had 24 hours to create more. And they're flowers, big ones, not just flowers, so it wouldn't take too much time to create some more. Why orchids and not ships or weapons? Soong was obsessed with creating living beings like flowers, butterflies, and humans, not machines. Even the beacon is not his idea, it was Sutra's. By the way, I found Sutra more interesting than her sister Soji, and I'm a full-blooded heterosexual woman. I agree with you. Sutra was definitely the way to go with that night. If you had a Friday night to spend, I'm Sutra all the way. Now, I said that there were some things I didn't like. One is the stupid JL thing, and the other one is the look of these hell beasts. They look the same as those in Avengers, but I guess every single show or movie now borrows something from the MCU. Anyway, that was my thought of the show. I don't think, nor do I want to change your opinions or anyone else's, who didn't like Star Trek Picard, and that's the beauty of it. We can all have a different perspective and taste, but we can still enjoy it and each other. I enjoy your rants, and I hope this letter will trigger some more. Until the next time, stay healthy, happy, and horny. It says that right there, Vesna. Well, Vesna, what a delightful letter, all the way from Sarajevo, uh, which is great. I want to thank you for writing in. Uh, very, very, very cool. Richard sends in a tip after that and says, I actually think Picard becoming a robot is kind of redeemable. Remember when Q said Picard would explore and experience things he could never imagine? For instance, seeing Picard appear as a kind of R. Daniel uh, Olivar figure in Discovery Season 3 could be interesting. You know what? I'll tell you something. That's an idea. If they, if they take away his lifespan and Picard's still alive a thousand years in the future, I would totally be down with that. I mean, he 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 really has become Methuselah. I I I, I would be bring, but you know what, Picard for Discovery season three. Hell yeah, why not? Bring it on. I'm in. Count me in. Um, and remember, speaking of Picard, I keep I just read what you guys send me. This comes from Omar ninety four. Hi Rob, your problems with Star Trek Picard give me a theory I want to tell you about. I don't watch Picard, but whenever I read or hear Akiva Goldsman's involved with a project, I raise an eyebrow. Sure, he has an Oscar for A Beautiful Mind, but other projects he works on either turn out meh or not that good. Now, my theory about it is this. It is possible Goldman is a really good writer, or Goldsman is a really good writer and writes solid scripts, which is why so many projects are brought to him as people see something in his writing. But what he wrote was different than what was on screen because of meddling. 
uncredited rewrites, or a failure to reach a compromise, but his name is still attached to the project. When it comes to making movies, TV shows, etc., there are people who clearly know what they're doing, but others can get involved and start making wrong decisions. For example, he was involved in Batman and Robin, but since Warner Brothers was adamant about writing, wanting a lighter Batman, what he wrote on the page could have been different than what was on screen. I even read that Goldsman had concerns about the script during pre-production discussions with Joel Schumacher. In the case of Picard, I don't watch it, but hearing you talk about it, it is possible that Goldsman could not reach a compromise with Alex Kurtzman and Michael Chabon on the overall story, so all three of their ideas got pieced together in a way that doesn't flow well. What do you think? First of all, I heard Michael Chabon pronounce it. It's Michael Chabon. So Michael Chabon is how it is pronounced. Uh, I was very happy to hear that. By the way, there's a very interesting interview with Akiva Goldsman and Michael Shabon on the web. You can probably look it up. I don't know if it's for Wired or not. But Akiva Goldsman's constantly butting in and making bad jokes, which was like, uh, it was like fingers on a chalkboard to me. But thanks, live long and prosper, Omar. You know, I don't, I think he's got too many, uh, too many genre credits that you can't look at it and go, it's not just meddling. And when it comes to feature film work, if people are meddling or the director changes things, um, there is such a thing as arbitration. No, I think I think blame needs to be squarely put on Akiva Goldsman. I really do. A hundred percent. This next one comes from Christopher McCulloch. Uh, Mr. Burnett, with the recent ending of Star Trek Picard, I've been revisiting Mass Effect. It's exceptional to me because it represents something sorely underserved in video games. Real science fiction. I know that sounds ridiculous in a medium replete with space marines and alien invaders, but unlike most games supposedly in the genre, Mass Effect's setting wasn't merely a thin premise for some morally safe violence. I realized Mass Effect was different when it answered the first question every good work of space science fiction has to, how does our civilization go from planet A to planet B? This question is what makes science fiction and how is it answered differentiates between what is hard sci-fi, what is possible, soft sci-fi, what is plausible, and space fantasy. The technology is magic. This is a great letter. Whether it's a reaction between matter and antimatter that causes a warp in space-time, grotesquely mutated psychic humans ingesting the spice melange in order to navigate folded space, or they're flying around with a class 1 droid that computes the coordinates into hyperdrive, These are all answers to that fundamental question, how can this interstellar civilization exist? Do they use relativistic space travel, or have they been able to work around it? For that reason, it's also usually the biggest ask in a sci-fi story, give us this magic space engine and we'll promise everything else will be either realistic or plausible. Or, for space fantasy, they have magic space engines. That's why Mass Effect was such a pleasant departure. Man discovers element zero, which which allows for the manipulation of mass, the titular Mass Effect. It might not seem like much, but it's not just a throwaway detail. It's central to how every civilization in the galaxy operates, and that they put any effort into it at all makes the game exceptional. I consider this the first question to be answered because how it is answered dictates what every aspect of your universe looks like. In your experience, what has been your favorite, most clever, or most interesting answer to this question? Ooh, what a great question. This is a great letter, Christopher. Uh, I got an answer for that. No, I really do. In, In Dan Simmons' Hyperion, in the Hyperion Cantos, uh... They have these things called the Farcaster Network, where it's literally a portal, and it's like it's like there, imagine a river, right? In the middle of your the river, there's a portal, and you go into the river, and you go through this portal, and it transports you to another planet in a river where their therefore Farcaster Farcaster portal is. Now it doesn't really deal with interstellar travel, but it's more like a rift in space time, a stable rift that takes you from planet to planet. And I think it's very, very, very cool. There's still spaceships as well. But I love that, those portals, and I love the idea of the portals. But Christopher, what a great letter. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you for thank you for writing in. Um, Stubble McShave sends in a tip and says, You need to see Chris Stuckman's review of Veronica. Oh, I watched it. Now, for those of you who don't know what Veronica is, Veronica is... Uh, Glenn Danzig's feature film debut. He wrote and directed it, and apparently he edited the film. 
and uh, it's based on his Verotic comics, uh, or some of them, and and I've only seen Chris Stuckman's review, but by all intents and purposes, well, all intents and purposes, I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but for all intents and purposes, I've heard it's one of the worst movies ever made, and just by watching clips on Stuckman's review, it looked really incompetent, but there's something compelling about watching it. Uh, the editing alone, the shot choices, there's no continuity. Uh, I totally agree. I mean, if you haven't watched Chris Stuckman's review of Erotica, what are you waiting for? Get on that son or sons and daughters or however you identify yourselves. It, Chris, just look it up. It's amazing. Amazing. And it is one of the most entertaining things I've seen. It is just, uh, it's unbelievable. You look at it and you're like, how did this happen? Like, how do you, and what was amazing is they said, they talked about how they spent so much time with a French dialect coach teaching people how to speak French. Oh my God. Wow. Wow. Um, amazing. <laughs> I'll tell you. Wow. Sorry. I know people don't like to hear me drink. Um, Mark Evans sends in a tip and says, even if you subscribe to the idea that consciousness is a product of the brain, it can't be separated from the brain. His memories, maybe, if you feel that the brain stores this as data, that's probably what was transferred. Picard is dead. He is dead. He is dead. He's dead. Picard's dead. Uh, I agree. Mark, because you're no longer, just because you've had your 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 memories your memories, it's a, it's a recreation. It's a simulation. Just like it wasn't really data, it was a simulation. But data was a machine anyway. But if you're flesh and, if you're flesh and blood and your flesh and blood dies, even if your brain is transported or your memories, or engrams, whatever you want to call it, is put in the body of a synth, a golem, whatever, you're dead. You're dead. You're, you're absolutely dead. Mark C. sends in a super chat and says, Remember, Akiva, Gold Akiva Goldsman wrote Batman and Robin, Transformers The Last Night, and Jonah Hex. Yes, there is no excuse. Akiva Goldsman has no excuse. And we have to stop making excuses for the man. Uh, this next letter. Ooh, I like this letter too. Um, this letter comes from Brazil. And it comes from Namen Solomon. Namen Solomon, uh, and I don't know if that's where, uh, a real name, but Namen Solomon, my Namen is like, isn't that, isn't Namen name in, 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 from Germany or as, as Dieter would want me to say, Deutschland, I don't know. Um, but this is a good letter. It's a long one, but a good, a good one. Dear Robert, Facing the COVID-19, we are living a true Kobayashi Maru situation. See this article that I found in Forbes. Oh, you know me because I love articles. This apparently um, comes from Forbes from August 23rd, 2015. The philosophy of Star Trek, the Kobayashi Maru, no-win scenarios, and ethical leadership. Oh, Naman, you, you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay. This is by uh, Janet D. Stem Weedle, Weedle, former contributor, uh, and she writes about the ethics of philosophy of science. So here we go. From Forbes magazine, from Janet D. Stem, it's S-T-E-M-W-E-D-E-L, Weddle, Stem Weddle, Stem Weddle, Weddle, Stem Weddle, Janet Stem Weddle. Uh, and again, from Forbes, from August 23rd, 2015. Starfleet's no-win scenario training exercise tests ethical decision-making and leadership. Part of that ethical leadership is recognizing the limits of your powers and deciding what to do in the face of those limits. The Kobayashi Maru training simulation is in which Starfleet cadets encounter a civilian ship in distress. To save the civilians, the cadet would need to enter the neutral zone, violating treaty. Honoring the treaty means leaving the disabled freighter and its occupants in the neutral zone at the mercy of the Klingons. As the simulation is set up, entering the neutral zone to save the civilians also results in Klingons attacking and boarding the ship which the cadet is commanding. In its construction, the Kobayashi Maru is a no-win scenario. 
As we learn in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, James T. Kirk was the only cadet in Starfleet history to ever beat the Kobayashi Maru by reprogramming the simulation so that it was possible to win. Is the Kobayashi Maru a good test of leadership and of the ethical decision-making that's a part of it? And what should we make of the fact that Kirk seems to have beat the test by cheating? There's a way in which the Kobayashi Maru echoes the framing of ethical training as a matter of grappling with ethical dilemmas, with situations where your task is to choose the least bad of two bad options. This framing is what spawns trolley problems, which seems not to do much to help develop the ethical toolbox that gets us through the routine ethical decision-making essential to captaining a starship or living a good humanoid life. Not every ethical decision requires grappling with a dilemma. Indeed, most of the time, good ethical decision-making before there's a crisis can bring good consequences all around, heading off a moment downstream where you have to choose which stakeholder gets stuck with a dramatically bad outcome. Of course, constructing a training scenario where you're thinking that far downstream might not translate well into an hour-long captain's chair simulation for a cadet or for a, a, a gripping opening to the best major motion picture in the Star Trek franchise. But such big picture thinking about the effects of one's decisions downstream is a habit essential to good ethical decision making. As a cadet taking the Kobayashi Maru, James T. Kirk seems to have rejected the premise that leadership involves grappling with dilemmas. Kirk famously said that he didn't believe in no-win scenarios. He didn't accept the premise of the test that, outside of the artificial conditions of the simulation, there would be no way to save the people on the freighter without also drawing the attention of the Klingons, losing your starship to them, and quite possibly provoking a war. Kirk's impulse was to look for conditions where it was possible for those in the starship and on the disabled civilian ship to survive. As it happens, Kirk created those conditions by surreptitiously programming or reprogramming the simulation. There is a controversy among Trekkies over whether this counts as cheating. Kirk's commendation for original thinking on the Kobayashi Maru suggests Starfleet Academy's view that it was not. I want to just jump in here and talk about this. We never actually saw the Kobayashi Maru performed until J.J. Abrams' 2009 Star Trek movie in which case it was shown that Kirk reprogrammed the simulation but didn't have to do anything particularly creative once the program was reprogrammed to rescue the ship. He was just being a douchebag. One of the things I hated, hated about Star Trek 09, perhaps hated the most, is its portrayal of the Kobayashi Maru simulation because it just shows nobody believes that Kirk shared or showed any leadership ability or particular command prowess, it was clear that the Kobayashi Maru was reprogrammed and damaged. It wasn't working properly. So there was no possible reason that you could think of that he beat the Kobayashi Maru scenario. He didn't beat it. Yes, he rope, reprogrammed the simulation to reprogram the ship, but he didn't do anything interesting aside from reprogramming it. So why would he get accommodation for original thinking when it was obviously reprogrammed? That was stupid. What I always thought, and by the way, again, I'm not saying I can do things better, but in my mind, here is what I inferred from watching Star Trek II. That during that situation, Kirk figured out a way to reprogram the simulation where using tactics and command abilities that perhaps weren't programmed into the test or the test didn't allow you to utilize or nobody had ever utilized it, allowed you to use specific tactics to rescue the ship. Because the program, the, the simulation was designed to be no win, so there was no way to win. So he thought it was unfair. So what I, in my mind, I always thought Kirk did was reprogram the simulation, which made it possible for him to use command techniques. Maybe he went back and, and looked at the strategies employed by his old, his, his uh, hero, Garth of Izar. And maybe he applied perhaps military tactics used by somebody else throughout history that no one had ever thought to use before. And it looked like 
with the simulation that he just did something that was tactical, that showed his command prowess, that was unique, that no one had ever done before, and the simulation allowed him to do it because it was programmed to allow, he changed the programming to allow that kind of tactic to be employed. So then it showed Kirk, he would then have gone on to do something innovative using real tactics, real strategy to rescue these civilians on the Kobayashi Maru. This is something that I thought when I first watched Star Trek II. It's very nebulous. You're the you're the only, looking at the only man who ever beat the Kobayashi Maru. So when he did beat the Kobayashi Maru, it showed that Kirk had a vast knowledge, a wealth of knowledge, and understanding of tactics and starship command. And it was probably the first time anybody ever realized that James Kirk knows his shit. That's where the Kobayashi Maru scenario thing came from. But it was designed to always win. And when it didn't win, that's when, of course, Starfleet realized that, oh, he reprogrammed the simulation. But the thing is... He had already impressed with his command ability. That's how I thought it was. It was in Star Trek 09. It just shows that it's broken. Kirk knows he's going to win. He's not using any particularly interesting tactics. He's not showing that he was smart. That he what what by him reprogramming the Kobayashi Maru, it allowed himself to shine. His knowledge to shine. His his future command ability to be recognized. Whereas. In Star Trek 09, they did nothing to make you think that. Not only that, but Kirk, if you watch the deleted scenes, seduced a woman to reprogram the simulation for him, which made him a double douche in Star Trek 09. Anyway. Um, it's, a, it's good to question... I'm going to go back to the letter. It's good to question whether features of a situation that we take for granted really are fixed rather than changeable. When faced with two bad choices, it's good to try and find a third or fourth or fifth possible choice that is less obvious, but that might be better all around. I think the optimism embodied in Kirk's rejection of no-win scenarios is the sort of thing that can motivate creative thinking about how to do a better job sharing a universe, which really is what ethics are all about. But I don't think that's what the Kobayashi Maru was intended to test. Ethical leadership was a big part of Captain Picard's thinking. A crucial feature of good ethical decision-making in the real world is understanding the limits of your powers. You try to make choices that bring lots of good consequences and minimal bad ones that fulfill your obligations to everyone to whom you have obligations, including yourself. But you're doing it in a complex world where you must make choices on the basis of imperfect information and where other people are doing things that may impose constraints on your options. Ethics cannot require us to be omniscient or omnipotent. This means that sometimes even the most creative and optimistic ethical decision maker has to face a situation where none of the available choices or outcomes are very good. Of his reprogramming the Kobayashi Maru, Kirk says, I don't like to lose. Hardly anyone likes to lose, but if we're measuring wins and losses on the basis of outcomes we produce, the impacts we have on others measured against some hypothetical better outcome that we don't have knowledge or the power to produce, we are bound to lose at least some of the time, and we need to figure out a way to go forward when we do. In circumstances where the stakes are very high, life and death, we're faced with an array of possible ways to lose. Sometimes the best we can do is choose the option that we must endorse. Maybe that option is one that we will judge, is one that we judge will produce better consequences, avoiding war but at the cost of civilian lives or the disabled freighter. Maybe we choose trying to fulfill our obligations to the vulnerable vulnerable parties whose immediate needs are most urgent, even if the circumstances where our efforts are not likely to be successful. It's not clear that one of these ways to lose is the right answer. Young James T. Kirk reprogrammed the Kobayashi Maru because he didn't grasp the point of the simulation. Kirk thought it was a test of whether in the circumstances you could succeed in saving everyone. On that basis, he thought the circumstances were unfair, since there was no way to save everyone, so he changed them. In fact, the Kobayashi Maru is meant to find out how the cadet responds when it becomes clear that you can't save everyone, and that your best efforts may have created a situation where you can't save anyone, and that your best efforts may have created a situation, uh, oh, it's a test of character, and one that wouldn't work if the cadet knew ahead of time that that was the point of the test. 
The real test of the Kobayashi Maru is not how you respond in the simulator, but how you go on from there. Do you recognize that the universe may present you with situations your knowledge and powers are inadequate to address? That logic and ethical formula can only get you so far. That sometimes the least bad is the best you can do. Does this realization put you off the ethical responsibilities that come with leadership? Or do you use it to adjust your expectations of how being a leader might feel in extreme situations? Of the Kobayashi Maru, Admiral Kirk said the point was that how we deal with death is at least as important as how we deal with life. I'd add that it's important to be able to deal with trying to live up to our ethical obligations while knowing full well that circumstances and our own limitations cannot guarantee we will succeed. We don't like to lose. Sometimes we need to exercise original thinking to figure out which of the bad options available is the most like winning. That was by Janet D. Stemwedel, and it was sent in to us by Naman Solomon. Greeting, uh, what science fiction brings us such thinking? Greetings from the city of Cur Curitiba? Uh, Curitiba? Curitiba? Brazil. Naman Solomon. Well, hope I didn't butcher your name too bad, Naman. Uh, what a great letter, and what a, what a great get. You know, I haven't come across that essay before, but I probably would have found it at some point. I want to thank you for uncovering it further. Uh, what a great letter about the Kobayashi Maru. I think that that's, um, that's a really interesting idea. Uh, that, yes, it, 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 it helps you recognize, I guess, whether command is for you, knowing that that's what might happen. Um, yeah, I definitely think that that is a uh, a really really interesting uh, way to look at it, and I I don't disagree. I think that's uh, very 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 cool. So thank you for sending that in. I really appreciate that. Um, so let's see. Do I have other letters? I have lots of letters that I haven't read, um, and I I keep I keep trying to find more. Uh, but there are there are many. There are so many that I haven't read that I still have to come across or still have to do. And um, uh, this one comes from Danny Chadwick. Rob, if there's one good thing to come out of the disaster of Star Trek Picard, it's that I found a bunch of great YouTube channels to help me cope with the pain of watching my beloved captain debauched beyond all recognition. Yours has become an instant favorite. The breadth of your knowledge of genre, Star Trek in particular, professional experience in the entertainment industry, and the maturity and authority with which you speak on a subject matter is a rare, rare find indeed. I've been composing my thoughts on Star Trek Picard to send you a letter. It's still a work in progress. I have trouble keeping it under 5,000 words, and I'm sure that once the season ends, I'll have a lot more to say. So you'll have to look forward to that in your inbox in the not-too-distant future. Uh, I don't know if I've read this letter, but I'm going to keep going. Since I started watching you a couple of weeks ago, the word verisimilitude has been bonking around in my head. As a hobbyist filmmaker, I feel somewhat embarrassed that I had to look it up. But once I knew, I wondered if the projects I've been involved with over the years, particularly my di di directorial work, has that. And I was wondering if you'd be able to take a look at my last directorial effort and give it a verisimilitude grade. Wow. That's cool. The film is called Samson Act One, and it's only the first 15 minutes of a larger tale. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do here. I'm going to copy and paste this into the live chat. So you, everybody here, all of the 302 people that are in the live chat, um, let's see, or have been total, here is Danny Chadwick's film, Samson, part one. Uh... Act one. And it's only the first 15 minutes of a larger tale. Why we only made the bit I've included here takes a bit of explaining. The the TLDR, the, the long version, what TLDR version, is that I wrote far too much outline for the amount of time I was allotted and had to shoot what I had written in order to make the festival deadline. <laughs> Thank you in advance for your time and effort, and thanks for the outstanding work you're doing with your channel. 
For finding it has enabled me to jettison several of the flapping jaws in the political commentariat for my regular viewing routine. Well, that's very nice of you. Uh, well, thank you, Danny Chadwick. And here's his long version. I'm going to read this anyway because I thought it would, this is really interesting. Here in Utah, we have a small but active independent film community. I prefer the term hobbyist filmmaking, but I'm in the extreme minority on that. Throughout the year, there are several festivals devoted to local genre films, i.e. the Demon Chaser Film Festival at Halloween time for horror fans, the Vortex Festival in the summer for sci-fi fans, and the Dark Christmas Film Festival for strange holiday tales. Until we made this film, the time limit for films at these festivals was about seven or eight minutes. It doesn't give a lot of time to tell a complete story. I was able to convince the producer of the festival to give us 15 minutes so we could actually have some room to breathe and tell a complete story. I signed up with Gusto, having come off another project that I acted in and was ready to work out my directing muscles. My intention was to write a short story with a moral quandary, where multiple sides of an issue were debated by two people who were on opposite sides, but were locked in a space they could not escape from, much like an episode of Star Trek. But every time I sat down to write it, the idea simply wasn't ready, so proca proca pro procrastination kicked in. I wrote outlines over and over and then procrastinated more to try and motivate myself to get it done. I scheduled reading of the script that I hadn't written yet with Richard Dutcher. You probably don't know who that is, but suffice to say he's a minor celebrity around these parts and has directed eight feature films, so I knew I had something to deliver. But as the days ticked on and I justified my procrastinating putting anything in final draft by continuing to write outlines. Finally, the evening before the reading was to take place, I started pounding out my 15-page screenplay. Unfortunately, by the time I got to page 7, I realized I was writing a 40-page screenplay panic. I thought I had doomed myself. There was no time to come up with a new idea before my script reading and no time or resources to create a 40-minute film in a couple of weeks. I went to bed dejected, feeling like a total failure. I will have embarrassed myself in front of my mentor, lined up talent and crew for a project that couldn't happen, and procrastinated myself into an epic fail. But the next morning, while in the shower no less, I was still trying to extract myself out of this quandary, the reading was scheduled for that evening, and I was racking my brain for something, anything, that I could whip up to avoid my coming humiliation. Then my brain talked me down. You can just shoot what you have. It's a solid idea. Find a good place to leave it on a cliffhanger, call it Act 1, and you're golden. But then people would only get like a quarter of a movie, I said out loud. So, my brain retorted, what's worse, not delivering at all or delivering 15 minutes of something good with the implied promise of more? Plus, it will be something you can show potential investors when you're ready to make the whole thing. So that's what I did, and I'm rather pleased with the results. Although it's obviously an amateur effort, nonetheless, I'll think, I think you'll enjoy it. Well, Danny, uh, I gave it to the rest of the members of the Post Geek Singularity. I would encourage you to all leave your comments. Tell Danny if it does pass the verisimilitude test. I will indeed watch it, and I will tell you, Danny, if I think it uh, passes the verisimilitude test. Absolutely, 100%, because why not? I want to thank you for writing in. I also want to say congratulations for getting a project done. Good for you, sir. How many people say, you know, a lot of people would have just given up and not had your reading and blown it off, but you sold you through, you powered through, and you made what you made. That's what filmmaking is. I think it's great. I think it's great that you did that. Uh, fantastic. Well done, sir. I can't wait to watch the movie, and I'll get back to you. Solo is an okay movie, says Stubble McShave, but I dislike that it feels like his background facts are stringed together with a mediocre plot. Everything we've ever learned about Solo's background is touched upon. It felt like a greatest hits album rather than a great album. You know, Stubble, I gotta agree with you there. It's just like, I, I never liked how Indiana Jones became Indiana Jones like in an afternoon as we witnessed in the beginning of Last Crusade. I'm like, come on, man. You know, things happen. Uh, you don't have to touch on every single moment of, of of Solo's life in this small piece of a bit of time. Um, Jamie Cruz sent in a super chat and says the Kobayashi Maru, the 1989 novel by Julia Eklar, tells a story well, along with how the rest of the Enterprise crew faced the test. Yes, I like that. I like that uh, Star Trek uh, book. I think it's pretty good. I have that right over there. Uh, I think you might be right about that. Garen Gillum sends in a tip and says. Uh, R.E. Picard dying, but aren't our memories who we really are? 
Look at it another way. If your memories are wiped clean, the previous you is basically dead. Consciousness and memory are such fascinating sci-fi concepts, but I doubt Picard will address them. I don't think they will. And that's why I think it's unfortunate. Uh, Jason S. sends in a tip and says, I agree with you, Rob. What Kirk did in the 09 movie was lame, but at least it was in the Kelvin universe. I'll believe that your version is what Kirk actually did in the Prime universe and thus is Star Trek canon. Well, you know, they don't really tell you, but I definitely think that uh, that's kind of the way I thought about it. You know, you still want to admire uh, Picard. I mean, you st you know, this this idea that I uh, admire Kirk this idea that he's just a douchebag. He doesn't... All he did in the Star Trek 09 movie was seduce a woman that reprogrammed the simulation for him. And I don't even... I don't believe it. I don't believe a minute of it. I don't know. Listen, I'm talking and Tallulah's barking in the background. I don't know. Should I get Tallulah and Gilbert? Should I let them come in? Should I go get them? It is Friday. Uh, why not? Um... I'm going to go get them and let them in and have them be on the show and give them cookies. How about I do that? Hi, guys. I know. I decided to come out and let you on the show. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, see, look at that. Yeah, I know. Oh, I know. Okay, hang on. Uh, hang on, you, 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 uh, uh, wait, 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 you're gonna, come here, come here, come here, come up, Tallulah, come here, come up, you coming up, you want cook, oh, they don't even want cookies, you guys gonna come, Gilbert, you're gonna come in here, come here, Tallulah, come on, yeah, you gotta get up so people can see you, yeah, that's right, Tallulah, yeah, that's right, there you go, ASMR, right, would you like another cookie, I know you do, Gilbert, come here. Gilbert, come here. Come here, Gilbert. Come around. Oh, you already had two cookies. Everybody likes to see the doggos. No, Gilbert gets his cookies. Oh, he's under the bed. He's on. Gilbert, you got to come around. Come here. Come here, buddy. No. Look at this. Look at this greedy dog. You're a greedy dog, Tallulah. Gilbert, come here. Gilbert. No, no. Gilbert, come on. Here, come here. Come through. You have to come up here, too. Come here, Gilbert. You got to come up. Come up, Gilly. There you go. People want to see the they want to see the double dog action. Right, buddy? Yeah, dude. Yes. Oh, I want another cookie. You only got one cookie, Gilbert. Here, come up again. That's right, buddy. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, look at these guys. Look at these doodles. This is doodle mania here on Rob Observations. Right, buddy? Yeah. Look at these these best of friends. Aren't you? Aren't you? This is a total doodle break. It's a dog break for the doggos. Well, there they go, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody complains that uh, I don't have Gilbert and Tallulah on enough. But there you go. They got to come in on the show. You put up with it. Here they are. And uh, we're all the better for it. Uh, this next letter comes from Chad Rupnerine. Rupnerine, I think. R-U-P-N-A-R-I-N-E. Rupnerine. Chad Rupnerine. What a cool name. Uh, here it goes. Uh, hello, notoriously sanctimonious Robert Meyer Burnett. I've been watching you since you started your podcast. I've heard you many times wax poetic about how today's Star Trek is not the Star Trek of yore. And I quite agree. I'm nowhere near as big a fan as you are and therefore do not have the same breadth of Star Trek knowledge that you have. But I'm still in inclined to agree. This evening, before I wrote this, YouTube recommended a Star Trek The Next Generation clip to me on the front page. It was a scene from the show that I remember seeing years ago, but I don't remember the episode at all. You probably know it well. There was a scene where Commander Data was the acting captain of the Enterprise. Geordi, Data, and Worf are parsing out some information regarding another ship in transit to a location. I'll, pa I'll paste the YouTube link here. Uh... Okay, I, I, I haven't, I, I'm not looking at this, but if Data is in command, I would, I, it's either Redemption or it's Gambit, I would imagine. Um, so, uh, those, <coughs> hey, you already got your cookie. Why you gotta be that way? Why you gotta be that way? So I put that into the live chat. I, I, I'm not gonna watch the, the clip here, but I would imagine it's from Gambit or Redemption. But if, if it's Redemption, it's, it's not Redemption because he's on a different starship. So I would imagine it's Gambit. 
maybe Gambit Part One. Uh, I'm sure you know it. I watched the clip, and as I finished, I suddenly realized why I like classic Star Trek so much. Hey, why don't you stop? Why do you have to stop? I know. Come here. Come here. Do you want to come up here? I know. Come up. Come here. That's it. You just want another cookie? All right. Well, if you're going to stop barking. Look, both of you guys come. All right. You each get one more little cookie. That's it. Come on up. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Huh? Yeah, guys. Look at you guys. You guys are so adorable. Aren't you? You're just so adorable. Yes. Yes, you are. Both of you are. Okay, Tallulah, you are a pain in my tuchus. Come on, right? I know. Yeah, I know. You just know I like redheads. All right, anyway. Um, I'm sure you know it. I watched the clip, and as it finished, I suddenly realized why I like classic Star Trek so much, even though I'm not a hardcore fan and why I don't care much at all for today's Star Trek. Though Bad Robot Star Trek can be a fun ride, they don't have at all what classic Star Trek had in spades. Nobility. Ooh. The scene where Captain Data handles the situation with Worf openly disrespecting his authority as captain, I think, encapsulates what is so great about classic Trek. He could have got angry at Worf and reprimanded him, but instead, I know this clip, took the high road and explained plainly his discontent for Worf. By doing that, he gives Worf the opportunity to see his own error. Data, showing him respect by speaking plainly and in private, combined with their mutual friendship, put Worf in a place where he could not only see his error, but feel comfortable to admit it. Not just to his ranking officer, but to his friend. They both come away from the situation with a friendship and a professional relationship, not just intact, but strengthened and reinforced, and now the mission can continue uninhibited. Now, I can't remember this episode at all, so for all I know, their relationship degraded and the mission failed and the Enterprise exploded, <laughs> but I do feel like that one scene, on its own, is representative of what some of us miss about classic Trek. The show was not a base at all. It was all about being a better you, a higher you, the you we all wish we could be and know we could be if we'd made the hard decisions. I have respect for our base needs. We're all animals as much as men after all, and our base needs have their place. But not being a slave to what is base is what allowed us to build great cities and fly into space. As crazy as things are right now, politically and socially, the future has never been brighter for the human race than it has for the past 200,000 years. Star Trek, from my point of view, is all about us aspiring to a brighter future, and all of us doing our small, seemingly insignificant part to make that happen. We are all heroes in our own small way. Maybe all we did today was greet someone with a warm smile at the elevator as we left our apartment. No, because you wouldn't be social distancing then. No, I'm just kidding. But it's no less heroic. We all do our part, and that's the great message of Star Trek for me. We should all do our part. Thanks and love the show. Chad. Rupneri. Rupneri? I think it's Rupneri. Uh, what a great letter. I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think one of the problems that I have with modern Star Well, uh, hey, that was, <laughs> there was some kind of a power surge and literally everything just flickered, just went, <laughs> everything was off. And then the power came back on and I'm like, wow, I can't believe that I was, it's a, it's, I just want to say that th that was an amazing example of technology working i mean uh i don't know how i was able to get back on the stream but uh it worked so first of all uh, mad props to both um both wirecast the software that i use and youtube because apparently on the because the youtube side the power didn't flicker off and i didn't turn the show off so it was still live and i was able to jump back in that's that is some crazy I, I don't have the letter I was reading, but um, wow, uh, that was pretty crazy. And I didn't lose, obviously, what I was looking at in terms of 
reading people's super chats. So I guess <laughs> I guess I'm still here. That's uh, that's craziness. Um, so let me let me uh, just find out where I was here. I I had letters to read. Um, I don't know what that was. That was so bizarre. Uh, but hey, what can I say? Uh, we were able to do that. I was able to get back on, but I don't know. I don't know what letters I was reading, unfortunately. Let me just jump on for a second and say, um, uh, Chairman Mao sent in a tip that didn't disappear and says the COVID-19 delay is a blessing in disguise for Marvel. For anyone upset there wasn't an Avengers film slated, be glad they didn't because it would have been bumped. By pushing everything back six months, we now have a packed late 20 and to mid-22 slate. Yeah, that could be. I mean, it definitely has to give people, it gives people, uh, I mean, they, they have, they have their work cut out for them. Um, and, and there's a lot, there's a lot that they, that they can read. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're right about that, Chairman Mao. Um, this letter comes, I, I, I apologize. I got cut off in the middle of that letter, but it, it, it I, I don't know where it is. I had it all lined up, and I've got a number of letters for you. I have so many to read. But this one comes from our man, Tony Martinson, longtime member of the Post Geek Singularity. This letter is about Han Solo's missing character arc, the rescue of him, and how they handle it all is what, for me, ruined Return of the Jedi, not the more childish tone of the Ewoks. His arc in A New Hope was start to start caring about the cause and remain loyal to his friends. Simple. His arc in Empire saw him continue that journey as a character by saving Leia and ultimately being willing to take a risk facing crimes of his past, going to Lando, in order to keep her safe. Even being willing to be frozen and potentially dying in the process again in order to keep her safe, telling Chewie to look out for her. It continued his path toward being a real hero. Ultimately, it set the stage for a great send-off in the third movie, seeing his character arc being completed. Then, in Return of the Jedi, they spent basically the first half of the movie trying to save him from Jabba, a long set piece with some great action and some not so great, and iconic moments and visuals, with a plan that seems overly convoluted with some weird logistics. They spend half the movie rescuing Han, and then Han basically doesn't do anything for the rest of the movie. His one thing is that he thinks something's going on between Luke and Leia, but that is never really fleshed out, nor does it add anything of importance to the story. He basically spends the final act of the movie in front of a giant door, and the movie ends. I fully agree with Harrison's idea of having Han die in a moment of sacrifice and importance to actually give his character and why it was so important to rescue him some weight in the story. Them saving him when he doesn't contribute anything to the overall plot of the movie after being saved has always felt like a huge waste to me, and it made Han's final appearance in the original trilogy very disappointing and anticlimactic and stings extra hard when taking into consideration that rescuing him takes up so much of that movie. Time could have been spent more on developing his and Leia's character further as their relationship deepened. That's also why I consider Return of the Jedi the weakest movie in the trilogy. It's a huge disappointment to me. The only thing in the movie that I find engaging and on the level of the first two is the stuff in the Emperor's throne room. That is, ironically, my favorite scene in Star Wars history. It's great. But unfortunately, how they handled not only Han, but the rescue of him and how that affects the rest of the story and the characters, it ultimately makes Return of the Jedi so disappointing to me. I even prefer how they handled Han in Solo more, which is a movie I really like, by the way. Um, you know... I think that you're absolutely right about that. Uh, I definitely uh, agree. I totally agree with you, as a matter of fact. Um, and why shouldn't I? Uh, because you are correct. As everyone knows, I'm not a huge fan of Return of the Jedi. So I can't necessarily... I can't go with you. Uh, with anybody that loves Jedi. There's a lot of people that do, and I, I always feel bad when... Um, I don't know. Uh, I always feel bad when people love Jedi, and I'm like, ugh. So disappointing. This next letter comes from Jared Snyder. Dear Robert, the benefit of working from home is being able to listen to you live. I want to thank you for bringing up the series UFO in a recent live stream on Midnight's Edge. UFO, as you can all see, is never far away from me. It's always there. Big bad Ed Straker. 
Um, I first saw the show as a summer replacement series on CBS, I think in the summer of 71 or 72. Wow. My brothers and I would hunker down around the black and white TV at 8 p.m. on Saturday to watch. At the time, I did not know that Jerry Anderson was the mastermind behind the show, but it was one of those kids... But I was one of those kids who grew up watching Puppetronics or Super Marionettes. I fell madly in love with Gabriel Drake, or Gabrielle Drake, but would not only years later make the connection between her and her very talented brother, Nick. I have such vivid memories of this show that I recently rewatched the entire series. I was impressed with the quality of the plots and the general good quality of the writing. Yes, there is Anderson's obsession with numbers and codes that he seems to have wanted the purple-haired women of Moonbase and Alpha and other women of Shadow to call out in odd, monotone voices. There's also his love of secret underground bases that can surface, which is great. However, there is also the real meat, as you pointed out, in stories like A Question of Priorities and The Square Triangle. That the show kept up the mystery of who exactly the aliens were without turning it into a mystery box is a tribute to the consistency and quality of the writing. There was no need to know more than what was required because the backstory wasn't needed because it wasn't important to the storytelling. Anderson got the most out of his limited budget, something that should be a lesson to anyone making great science fiction because it is not about having great effects but about designing effects that are perfectly placed and assist in telling the story. Amen. Hearing you talk about UFO reminded me of listening to the late Gene Shepard. Wow, that's... That's hugely complimentary. On WOR on AM radio under my pillow. I was obsessed with the very strange movie I had seen on the Big Three Theater afternoon matinee on a television station. It was The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T. The old days when there was no way to find out anything else about this film, but there was Gene Shepard doing a monologue about watching the very film and how strange and wonderful he found it. You gave me the same nachas hearing you praise UFO. Um, best wishes from rural Washington, my home state. Hope you're staying safe up there, Jared. Well, thank you very much. I mean, clearly you and I park our shuttlecraft in the same shuttle bay. We're probably similar in age. For those of you who don't know, I mean, if you don't know Jerry Anderson, he made the Thunderbirds, he made Captain Scarlet and Joe 90 and Supercar and Fireball XL5 and the Terra Hawks. But his first live action TV series was the 26th episode UFO. And I dearly love it. I even worked with Bill Hunt. We created an idea about how we would reboot UFO. And uh, ITV still owns it, still owns the, the series. And apparently they looked at our proposal, but they thought that, I guess, it, it didn't pass muster or we weren't showrunners. We've never been showrunners, so they wouldn't have gone with us. But I still think what, what I wanted to do for my UFO reboot, UFO takes place in 1980. And it deals the uh, deals with the clandestine uh, conflict. Earth, there, there's a multinational. All the nations of the the world band together and create a super secret organization called Shadow, which is the Supreme Headquarters Alien Defense Organization. And Shadow is is just like it says. It's in the shadows. No one knows about it. And it's a super secret organization that is fighting a very lonely war against aliens that are invading Earth, kidnapping our people, and using them. Uh, for organ banks, they're replacing or are they're using our organs to replace their own because they're a dying race, and it's basically about moon base, uh, not just moon base, but all Shadow has a moon bases and Earth bases and submarines and all kinds of things to fight this war, and the series focuses on Ed Straker who commands Shadow, and and how it truly is lonely at the top, and it is not a show that. It's almost the anti-Star Trek in that it's pretty fatalistic and dark. But as a kid, I love the show. I love the visual effects. I love the... the. It was a precursor to Space 1999. And indeed, it didn't get a second season because it was so expensive. They retooled it into Space 1999, although that took a while. But yeah, what we wanted to do is we wanted to reboot it now so it would be set today. But UFO would have happened. The UFO is detailed in the series... The development of Shadow from 1970 to 1980 would have existed. Now it's 40 years later, and we pick up the story. And it's very interesting because Colonel Lake, Wanda Ventum, this actress Wanda Ventum who played Virginia Lake, I believe she's in her 90s now, but she's still alive. She's Benedict Cumberbatch's mother. So there you go. I've always loved UFO. Uh, it would be a dream of mine to reboot that. If, if I could do any science fiction series right now, I, I was really happy with what we came up with with UFO. I would love to um, 
I'd love to try and remake that show. So I want to thank Jared for writing in. That's uh, very nice of you, very nice of you to write in. And um, yeah, you know, since I'm so discombobulated right now, I think I will bring an end to the chat today we are going to be back elizabeth and i will be back whining about movies where we share a bottle of wine and talk about a movie that she had never seen uh, i had never seen sound of music but this today we're going to talk about bob fossey's superlative 1972 cabaret so join us tonight at eight o'clock as we whine about movies well ladies and gentlemen uh <laughs> Rob casting to you, and then there's craziness that goes on. You just never know what's going to happen in this day and age. But uh, thanks to Wirecast and thanks to the great technology here at Apple, I was able to uh, turn my computer back on. It was very interesting. I don't know if that was a power surge or not, but literally everything went, phew, just flickered out. Um I hope it wasn't Thanos. But I want to thank you all for being here for Rob Observations episode number 381. I want to thank you for supporting the channel in every way you do. Please keep those letters coming. I'm slowly making my way through them. I still have a lot, but I'm going to run out soon. So please send me letters. Uh, thank you for supporting the channel in every way that you can. I very much appreciate it. I've got a few videos I'm going to show that I realized that I hadn't played. And... Um, I think Jeffrey Mao sent me a video that it doesn't play at all, so if he could resend it, I don't know. And we're going to see a Funko Pop video. It's going to be all crazy tomorrow. Obviously, I'm not on the John Campy show. I'll be back here probably at 1 o'clock. It'll be good to see you all back again. We'll have something more to talk about, I am sure. But I'll see you tonight at 8 p.m. Pacific time if you so are so inclined to do that. Join Elizabeth and I. Crack your own bottle of wine and join us. So, oh, Calvin Bowes sent in a tip Real quick, and he says, what TV show from the 60s or 70s would you like to make into a movie? I'd like to see Space 1999, although that would be called Moonbase Alpha. And for comedy, Gilligan's Island. Also, Perry Mason would be cool. Um, well, you know, so many of my favorite TV shows from the 60s have been, like, rebooted. Whether it was Wild Wild West, that didn't go very well. Or The Saint, we saw that. Or Man from U.N.C.L.E., um, the Prisoner was even rebooted as a TV miniseries, but I think from the 60s or 70s, wow, that's, that's, uh, I don't know, man. Uh, so many of those things have been done. Space 1999 would be, would be cool. I, I've actually read, I have a Space 1999 feature film script around here. My friend Adrian Iscaria tried to get it off the ground for a while as a feature film, but wasn't able to do it. But, um, for me personally, I mean, look, I'd love to do UFO as a movie or, or as a TV show. It'd probably have to be a TV show. But, yeah, that that's uh, that's probably what I would do. Even Wise Guy, my favorite Wise Guy, that was from the 80s, though. That got rebooted as a, they, they did a, a TV movie. But anyway, I want to thank you all for supporting the channel. Thanks for the generous super chats and tips and all that. But I also love the letters and the participation and all of that. So... Um, absolutely. It's just been great to have you here. I want to thank my moderating staff. I want to thank Mike Bodden for getting me all these letters and keeping the website maintained. So go to the burnettwork.net if you want. Check those things out. Check out the Imagination Connoisseur Gallery. I also want to thank my moderators. I noticed Jim Boyers, Detective Jim, uh, called me, but I was in the midst of trying to get everything back on. So thanks for Jim to being a moderator and looking out for me when stuff happens. And also I want to thank Greg Smith. I also want to thank Lewis Yu and Jordy Lyons for also being great moderators and members of the Post Geek Singularity. But most of all, I want to thank you guys, you Imagination Connoisseurs, you members of this, the Post Geek Singularity. And therein lies the end of this tale. Uh, this will be the end of Rob Observations, episode number 381. And remember, look, please hit like, please um, uh, uh, subscribe if you can, because that always helps the analytics. And the analytics have been really wacky lately. But thank you all for being here. Uh, remember, every person you meet has a story to tell you have yet to hear, and all you have to do is listen. I also want to thank Gilbert and Tallulah for making a lovely appearance on today's show. I hope that was okay with you guys. I want to thank Vesna also for sending a letter all the way from Sarajevo. That was pretty cool. I love that all of her letters, even when they're seriously discussing Picard, don't ever forget to remind us we're all randy and ready to go here at the Post Geek Singularity. So thank you all for that. Remember, uh, as always... Have a better day.